to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today we welcome back on the show Diane Shannon. She is an internal medicine physician and a physician coach, and she wrote the Kevin MD article. Hello, health organization leader. Are you listening? Diane, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here today. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today for those who didn't get a chance to listen to our first episode? Yes, certainly. I practiced as a primary care physician for just a few years, and then I just had to leave. And at the time, I could not have articulated why. I just knew I, it was something I had to do. I didn't see a lot of other options of making what it felt like an exhausting, stressful experience to be better. And so I moved into writing. I worked at a communications company for a few years and then started a, a freelance writing business and have worked in healthcare writing for 20 plus years. In the course of that, I was writing an article and stumbled across the definition of professional burnout. And it was like a light bulb went off and I had a word to describe what I had experienced. And that led to physicians contacting me after I shared my story in an NPR blog post. And from there, I just, I've been so motivated to do something about physician burnout. And so I worked on a book, wrote a book with another physician, and now am also a coach. And so I coach women physicians on work-life balance and confidence and creating lives that are actually uh, joyful and doable. So we were talking off well, offline about how many physicians now are coming to you with symptoms of burnout. And by the time this episode comes out, we're going to be myth of the latest Omicron variant of the COVID pandemic. So paint us a picture of what you're seeing in your physician coaching practice today. Right. So when I started coaching a couple of years ago, a lot of the questions were about work-life balance. And I, I'd really like to be spending more quality time with my kids. And how do I do that? And working, you know, on the tweaks within work, where the places where someone might have um, perfectionistic tendencies that are causing them to create notes that are much longer than they need to be, things like that, and also adding in self-care. What I have seen, especially over the last, I'd say, three months, has been this huge exodus where physicians are now coming to me saying, I cannot do this. I cannot go on. I have made it through the pandemic. It has been incredibly stressful but I am seeing the physical and mental effects of this and I simply can't go on. And so we, we work from that place. And sometimes, again, it's a little bit of working on the burnout. There may be places where they can get a break. They may go back to clinical, but there are an awful lot of physicians who are looking for non-clinical work now. And I think you know part of my writing this article when I did a, a number of months ago was to say, hey, we need to wake up. And organizational leaders really need to take this into account. And yes, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but if we don't get resources, support, help to physicians in their workplace, we're going to have more and more of an exodus. So yes, the great resignation, as they call it, has certainly affected physicians. For those physicians who come to you saying they can't do it anymore, any general demographic information in terms of what kind of specialties inpatient versus outpatient, or is it simply across the whole section of physicians? Well, you know, I work primarily with women physicians. I would say the ones coming to me have children, generally young children. Often they're in the first, let's say, 10 years of practice. So they've spent time building up their career at the same time when they were potentially having children, going back to work after having children. So there's that, that tension is part of it. But I think, honestly, the ones who are coming to me, it's often the numerous places where they don't have the resources they need. And granted, we know there's understaffing in support, but there are other things that are occurring that just, you know, I, I was just speaking with a, a physician this morning and she said, you know, why is it that they're asking us to make decisions about whether or not we have scribes and whether or not we pay for them 
and we have to make this decision between December 16th and the end of the year. And there are a lot of implications for this decision. And there's all like a lot of things happen in December. So that lack of awareness, yes, there's this option to have scribes. The physicians are now going to have to pay for it. But the lack of awareness about what that means to ask that question of them in the, at this point in the year and with so little time to make the decision. She also talked about how her organization changed from one video visit vendor to another one without any time for training or learning on that new platform. And so that's something, again, that physicians have to take on. They have to try to find the time when they have the bandwidth to understand the new system. And this is happening overnight. So those are just a few examples. I would say in terms of specialty, it's pretty much everyone. I do, I would say the, the, the ones I'm seeing right now, it is, you know, pulmonary intensive care hospitalists are, I would probably say the most physician or primary care physicians as well. But some of those specialties that you'd expect with, with what, what's going on with COVID. All right, let's transition into the Kevin MD article that you wrote. It's titled, Hello, Health Organization Leader, Are You Listening? Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Well, again, I, I, so much of it is, you know, talking with the physicians that I work with and hearing their stories and what their daily life looks like. And I just thought, you know, I've also spent 20 years writing about the healthcare system and inefficiencies and how it can be improved and leadership. And so much of this is, in my opinion, coming down to do organizations, the C-suite and the boards, do they value the healthcare workforce? And in my world, that's about physicians. Do they value physicians? And there's so many instances that I am hearing that, it, that really are examples of no, they're not valuing this incredibly precious resource. And when you think about what goes into the physician's time, why is that not being protected? Because that is, that is so incredibly valuable. So when you are expecting physicians to be the, the scribe and the data entry clerk and the documentation specialist and all of those things, that's taking away from that incredibly valuable patient care time that they could be providing. So it doesn't make sense on a financial basis. And the other, the other piece is, it's just the more and more there is this burnout, it's, it's just you know, a vicious, incredible, like snowballing effect, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have more physicians who are leaving or are cutting back on clinical time. And, and then the ones who are left, are holding more of the burden. So it, it's something that I felt I needed to call out and say, okay, in the past, you may have been taught in business school to look at the next quarter or to look at the next six months and to look at certain metrics, but you have to expand the metrics you're looking at to include well-being. You have to put that into the compensation for leaders that this is something they're being tracked on is what is the well-being of all the clinicians. And, and so I, I just think that's incredibly important. I've had a lot of healthcare administrators on the show and they, of course, write on Kevin MD. And if you ask them, you know, do you care about physician burnout? Every one of them, they're going to say yes. And I think a physician burnout has been at the forefront, especially during the pandemic. What are some actions they can do or what more can they do to back up their words? Right. Well, honestly, I, I think a big part of it would be being more visible. And, you know, there's a great program that they started at Mission Health in North Carolina called Immersion Day, where they'd have leaders come in and they would basically shadow the doctor or nurse for an entire shift. And when you do that, and in my case, you know, I ask, what does your day look like? And I hear this day that honestly is not sustainable. So if, if they were to see that firsthand and see what does it look like to be this nurse, to be this physician, and then begin to ask, what are the biggest pebbles in your shoe? And they may not be what they expect, right? And some of those are relatively easy to fix. 
right? One of the things that came out in this, I did a series of interviews in 2020 with women physicians about their challenges. And I was really surprised at how often lactation support came up as an issue. And that is something that can be addressed, right? But for someone coming back after having a child, they're not sleeping due to, to having a newborn, they're trying to pump, and they're given no time, space, or compensation for doing that, it's an, an additional stressor. Now that was true before the pandemic, but I think it's just a matter of really understanding, you know, put yourself in those shoes mm -hmm. and then ask the question, what are those pebbles? And then look for the ones where you actually can make a difference. And again, I think going back to it, if, if leaders' compensation were tied to some of these metrics that are important and actually important and impact other metrics that the organization cares about, then we would see more of a difference and more of a prioritization of what are the resources they need. There's, there's this all this paradigm shift that I think would be incredibly helpful, which is to go from kind of sink or swim, you know, let them take, let them take care of themselves, let them get through this to what would we do if our primary focus was retaining and advancing physicians and making the workplace sustainable. Like asking that question, what would we do? And then begin to do those, take those actions. You know, that's the first time I've heard of physician wellness potentially being a metric for a hospital CEO or a hospital administrator. To your knowledge, does any place do that? I have heard of organizations that are doing that now. I think it's something that's just starting. And part of that may be, you know, moving into having the chief wellness officer, especially if they're given the responsibilities and budget that they need to make a difference in terms of, of wellness. But yes, there are organizations that are beginning to do that. To be fair for healthcare administrators, a lot of hospitals are undergoing financial pressure. And in our primarily fee-for-service system, a lot of the fixes for clinician wellness, whether it's adding scribes, whether it's having clinicians see fewer patients, generally it's going to negatively impact the bottom line. So from the viewpoint of a healthcare administrator, how can he or she thread that needle to address clinician wellness while also maintaining the bottom line? You know, Kevin, this is like a really sticky problem. I, I, I completely understand that. I guess two things. One is if you think about, if you understand like the lean perspective, right? So there are a lot of places where there's still a lot of waste in the system. And what about looking for those places where there's waste to make everything more efficient and actually move patients through in a way that's less energy depleting to the clinician? So the other piece of it, I think, is to really be thinking more about prevention. And I know that is difficult in the current financial situation where most organizations are in right now. But this is really about preventing extreme costs in the future. And we know that it is very expensive to replace a physician, right? Half a million to a million dollars mm -hmm. in recruitment and onboarding and all the rest of it, getting that panel size back up. And you're also losing potentially a more experienced physician than, than you might be able to hire. So there are these downstream costs. I think part of it is connecting the dots to say that recruitment cost, that is something that is coming and can we prevent it? Now, I know that doesn't, that doesn't make for an easy trade-off because that's saving money in the future and having to invest it now, but in the end, I believe it's got to be more cost effective to retain those physicians than to continue burning them out and having them leave. We're talking to Diane Shannon. She is an internal medicine physician and a physician coach. She wrote the Kevin MD article, hello, health organization leader. Are you listening? So Diane, we do have a lot of health organization leaders listening to this podcast. So you have a platform now. You mentioned things in generalities, of course, scribes, more support, but if you were to give these health organization leaders specific actionable suggestions that they can do to improve physician wellness, what would those things be? Right. Well, first of all, I want to mention that in the article, I cite an article by some researchers, some of them are at Stanford and some of them are at Mayo Clinic, and it's the Tofik, Daniel Tofik article. And 
this has a number of specific actions that organizations can take to begin to improve clinician well well-being. And I just want to talk about one of them. So one is just looking at the list here. One of them is addressing gender disparities in compensation, retention and promotion. And so this is an area that, you know, as I said, I, I work with women physicians. This is a place where there are specific actions that they can take. I mentioned one in terms of lactation support, and there's more. I've, I've written about this, and there's organizations that are actually compensating with RVUs for periods of time for breaks when women physicians can go in and have that time to uh, pump and, and continue uh, with lactation. So in terms of, of other ideas, I, so that's a place to look for some of those specific action steps. There are a number of organizations that are looking into group coaching and individual coaching. So while burnout is caused by excessive stress in the workplace, there are also places where the individual has a role. And that's where I see my work as a coach. So in my writing, I focus on highlighting the system issues that drive burnout. And then in my coaching, I support the individual in the places where they have agency to make some changes that improve their the, their daily life experience. So some of it may be, you know, looking for expanded opportunities for clinicians to have group coaching. And one of them, I, I finished a program recently for women faculty. And, you know, the thing that was most valuable to them was the ability to have their their stories and their experience validated and to be with other peers and physicians today are so busy they have so little time to connect with peers and have their experience validating and i think especially with covid it has been so isolating so looking for some of those opportunities to support that connection i think is another way to to address burnout right now and my final question what are some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? Right. Well, I'll just speak for myself in, in my journey. And that has been, we are human. And I think so much of medicine and my medical training was about just keep going, right? You don't need, you don't have any human needs. You don't need to attend to them. So you don't need sleep. You don't need to eat well. You don't need exercise. Just keep going. And I think it's so easy to continue with those kind of ways of thinking and ways of being that worked well and were rewarded in training, but really don't make for a well-balanced life going forward. And I think that that was a big lesson for me in my experience of burnout. And now what I try to kind of support others in having that more well-balanced life and, and rethinking some of those messages in how we live. Diane, thank you so much for coming back on the show and sharing your time and insight. Thank you.